Thank you. Let's do questions. So, forgive my ignorance, but uh, it's still wired. Right? Yeah. Is it? Is there plans for it to be wireless? Or... Yes. Um, so, so right now it's wired. Basically, you have uh, you have the, the current implementation. You can use as long of an HDMI or DVI cable as you want to a small control box. You can wear that on your belt or in your pocket even, um, or set it on a desk. And then from there, there's a single six foot cable that carries all the head tracking information, all the video display information, um, and that is six feet long. Wireless technology is really advanced. Like even three years ago, wireless video transmission technology, there wasn't a way to transmit wireless video um, uncompressed in high definition without significant latency. We're getting to the point where it's possible, but it's high power consumption, it's fairly large, so that means you have to add a pretty high powered battery system. And all of a sudden you're back to adding a lot more weight than uh, you would have had to deal with. And not just weight, but cost too. Um, in a few years, it'll certainly be possible to be wireless without some of these compromises. Where it's really all going, I think, and this is my own personal opinion, is that um, computing power is getting more and more powerful on smaller and smaller devices. I mean, like, you know, there are phones out there that are, you know, quad-core two gigahertz processors with two gigs of RAM and a gigabyte of dedicated VRAM. It's insane. That's better than computers, a, few, a lot of computers a few years ago. Um, Eventually, I don't think it'll be wireless as in tether. I think it'll be wireless as in all of the rendering horsepower will be on the device, and so that you won't be tethered to anything at all. Cool. Thank you. Hey, thanks very much. Uh, I was excited to hear you get up there and say, among all the other things, how VR is going to change society. Yes. I'm curious to hear your thoughts about you know when Oasis happens, what's that going to mean, and is that a good thing? You know, I mean. <laughs> You know, the Oasis as a fictional concept is, it's, it's basically the, it is so fantastical. I mean, there's all kinds of implications in society a, lot, a long time before we get to Oasis. Like, I actually worked a little bit in, in uh, military VR simulation, and they use it for some really cool training, to be able to train soldiers how to do things without actually putting in, in harm's way. Um, or to even treat them for post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, by exposing them to things that they're, that they're trying to deal with. And there's also exposure therapies to help people get over phobias. Like, um, it turns out people, if you tell them over and over, hey, this isn't actually real, you're not actually seeing spiders on a table, it's easier for them to get comfortable with the virtual spiders on the table, and that does carry in over into being able to get over their, their, their fear of the real spiders on the table. Uh, but those are specialized things, you know, th those impacts for society, they're on a small level, they're individual little things. Something like the Oasis where everyone is connected and can do anything and everything and it's all cross-platform and cross-everything and everything works together. I don't even know what that would do. I mean, we're trying to build the technology. Um, I mean, the, the, probably the best people who are, the, the people who are going to imagine that are going to be game developers or, uh, you know, science fiction authors who really are professionals at thinking about these things and making these things. Um, one interesting thing that I'll, I'll just throw out there that I liked about the Oasis was the idea that the virtual economy became more powerful than the real economy. I think we're a long ways away from that. But it's at least very conceivable that you would have a virtual economy that, if big enough and allowed to exchange into real cash, would surpass the economy of, of, of a few of the smaller countries out there. I don't know about becoming the dominant currency, though. I don't know. Is there anything else? I, I know that wasn't a, a solid answer. I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Hey, Chase, now that you're giving the dev kits to the development community, I was wondering if you could uh, uh, give them a, a kind of advice concerning controls. What we've been doing for controls right now is not ideal. We've been showing most of our demos on, on game pads you might have seen and a few keyboard mice. That's not because they're the best inputs. It's because they're the inputs that people are familiar with, and if you're giving a demo, you don't want to try to train them to use two radically new devices at the same time. One is hard enough. Um, VR is going to need different control schemes. Um, one thing we've been experimenting with, and some of the, the some of our partners who have, who have uh, you know early rifts, they've been experimenting with the Razer Hydra. It's a it's a it's it's two wands that uses a magnetic tracking technology, so that you can actually track both of your hands uh, with six degrees of freedom. I think the controllers like that are a really big step forward for VR. We're working on a lot of cool stuff. I can't say exactly what we're going to put out eventually, but. Um, we definitely have a long way to go on input devices, and I think working with the Hydra and other motion control technologies is something that developers would, you know, get a lot of get get a lot of benefit out of starting to work with now. Um, how different are the planned consumer kits going to be from the initial dev kit? Very different. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, from I guess from a content creation standpoint, are we going to have to go back and rewrite shaders and from a content? For yeah, and in the initial versions of the SDK, are we going to have to go back and rework a lot of things when those get released or? 
you know, we haven't really finalized it. What we're trying to do out there is get these developer kits out there because we've solved not all the problems. Like, you know, we, met, we talked about input. We don't have it solved today. Um, what we're starting to solve is the visual aspect. And the visual aspect, the head tracking, you know, providing an immersive display, that's the first thing that needs to exist. It's the piece that's really been, that, that, that's been missing for developers. Um, the consumer version, we're planning on having a much higher resolution, much smaller, lighter, uh, more comfortable, uh, more robust optical adjustments. Uh, in terms of content development, I wish I could say more. We really need to find out. I mean, that's one of the reasons we're putting these developer kits out there. We don't have a perfect planned consumer version that we're just waiting to get around to. We need to hear from developers and they need to get back to us and say, look, these are the things that are wrong right now that you need to fix. Here are features that we want or here are features you need to prioritize because we need them to create experience that we want to create. So the consumer version, it's still in flux. We, we, we've made a lot of progress, uh, but we need to hear from people like you on what, we think should, on, on what you think should be in it. Thank you. Hi, I know we're at GDC, but I'm actually be curious to hear a little bit of your thoughts on other uses of the of the Rift and in, in, in VR, and more specifically in architecture visualization. So architectural previs is something that a lot of people have been interested in because, um, and that's real, not the emotion things or the immersion things, but really a sense of scale. I only really barely touched on it. Um, one of the reasons that so many architectural people really want VR, and they've been experimenting with it for a long time. It's just you know, been so hard to do correctly. Um, but one of the things they, th that's really valuable about, the, about that is you can build a virtual space very cheaply. Now, a lot of these architectural firms are using tools like Unity or UDK to create models of homes that are, you know, multi, multi million, multi tens, multi hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, so that their clients can sort of see the virtual representation and say, oh, you know, this room's too big, or oh, I think that I want to move this wall over there, or oh, you know what, I think that that entire deck is just stupid. Um, and I think that virtual reality's sense of scale really allows you to get a better sense of that. You can walk into a room and say, wow, I can actually tell how big this room is, which is hard to do on a monitor. You don't, well, I mean, what if, what if the walls are 20 feet tall? <laughs> it's very hard to tell on a monitor. In, in a virtual reality device, it's much easier to see a sense of scale. So for architecture, I think that there's going to be a lot of interesting things. We're not working on it specifically because we're trying to build uh, the tools that game developers need. But a lot of those tools are the same ones that people will want for architecture. Um, as far as other uses, you know, I mentioned some of them before, you know, uh, exposure therapy for different phobias, uh, different kinds of simulation training, not just for soldiers, but also for you know, fire and police. Um, virtual reality has actually been used a lot for surgical simulation so that surgeons can you know, operate, on, operate virtually on things that are not real living, breathing people because you know, let, let's not mess up on those. Um, there's a whole ton of possibilities beyond that. Oh, racing simulation. I mean, F1 drivers don't just hop in their car every day and you know peel around the track until they get good. Uh, they actually use simulation simulators that are some of the best in the world. You know, entire cars on motion platforms because it's a much safer, cheaper way to learn how to drive those kinds of cars. Thank you. How you doing? Um, I have almost the same question, but maybe a different angle on it. Um, so, so far, all of your messaging has been um, you're creating VR tools for gamers, and, but obviously it's, it's much bigger than gaming, even though it's being pushed by gaming. Is Oculus going to be the game VR company or the VR company? <laughs> the VR company. Okay. Um, I mean, the reason we're focusing on game developers is, well, there, there's a few reasons. One is I'm a gamer. I really like video games. I've, I've worked in VR, uh, in, you know, VR simulation for the military, and I've, I've, I've worked on a few PTSD projects just briefly. But what I really want to do is play video games in VR because that's what I like to do. And gamers, you know, they tend to be, uh, they tend to adopt early technology a lot more willingly than a lot of consumers would. You know, people say, oh, you can take virtual vacations. I don't know if the average person is ready to strap something onto their face to go on a virtual vacation. But if you look at a lot of the gaming hardware out there, I mean, there's gigantic headphone, you know, headsets that are out there. Gamers don't, don't say, oh, I don't want to wear a huge headset. They're like, that headset looks badass. I'm totally going to buy that headset. And I think that right now, where we are today with the hardware just starting, gamers are really the right audience to target, and game developers by extension. All right, thanks. And I just want to say thanks for opening up this entire world, because it's... Oh, thank you. There's a I lot. did it for myself. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, two years ago, I made a decision to become a game engineer instead of going on to college and getting a degree in computer vision, doing what you do now, so thank you for that. Uh, my question for you is, I know that you have quite a collection of VR hardware. Um, is it possible for me to purchase a galvanic vestibular stimulation system for less than the price of a small car? Yes, it's actually, they're, they're not that expensive to make. So, okay, where just, can I get one? <laughs> uh, so just for background, uh, two things. I think I have the world's largest private head mounted display collection, I think. I have 49 unique units, not including doubles and not including the ones I've made myself, because that wouldn't be fair, I'd just make a bunch. Um, but it's a, I mean, it's a huge collection and I've, I've collected it over the years. Uh, uh, military, uh, military auctions, government auctions, hospitals sell off their old gear for dirt cheap when they don't know what it is. Um, eBay is a good place to search. There's companies that sell industrial equipment for pennies on the dollar. They don't know what it is either. Uh, it's been harder recently because now more people are into VR and I'm, I'm getting all this competition. It's really actually pretty frustrating. I'm, I don't know how I'm gonna grow my collection now. Um, in terms of galvanic vestibular stimulation, you know what it is, but for everyone who, else, who doesn't know what it is, um, it's a technology where generally using electrodes that are placed on your head, you can pass electrical signals through your head that trick your inner ear into thinking that you're moving in ways you're not. So you know, your vestibular system is your balance system. It's what's used to, so that I'm not falling over. It's what's used to, well, it's, it's, what, uh, it's what's used to let you know that you're tipping over and it keeps you upright. What galvanic vestibular uh, stimulation lets you do is pass these electrical, these electrical um, signals through your inner ear that actually trick it into thinking that it's doing things it's not. So you can pass signals that say, hey, I'm actually totally sideways, or hey, I'm actually spinning in a circle right now, or I'm actually moving forward at great speed. Um, it's generally a bad idea to do when it's not paired with anything else. See, if, if you guys Google it, you can find some fun videos people have made where they've made headbands, uh, where they have blindfold people and have them run forward, and then they can make them run in different directions because they think they're falling and try to compensate by running off in a different direction. Um, VR, potentially, hypothetically, in theory, could be a good fit for GBS technology because uh, you are tracking your head movement. You can actually say, hey, in the game, I'm going to show the fighter jet doing a roll, and then using these simula simulators, I'm only going to make them feel like they're actually rolling, even though they're sitting in a chair. The problem with GBS is that, oh, well, there's so many problems. Um, <laughs> Aside from the safety you know, issues, of course. There's, there's so many issues. I mean, there's one, the, the fact that you're basically taking high voltage, you know, high voltage, uh, high, high voltage electrodes and passing current through your head to, for, for entertainment. Um, and then everyone has different skin conductivity. People, it's, it's not a uniform thing. Um, what works well for one person, like what, what gives a good effect for one person might do nothing to another person. And what works, you know, what, do, what one person can't feel in their skin is going to burn the skin of the other person. It's, it's a very tricky thing to do. As far as actually answering your question, can you buy one? I'm not gonna sell you mine for liability <laughs> reasons. Um, but you can, you can actually find, there's a few professional systems that yes, do cost as much as a small car. Um, if you Google around for you know, GBS schematics or galvanic vestibular stimulation schematics, there's actually two or three guys who have um, very bravely put up on their blog schematics to make these things. I mean, you can actually do it for like 10 bucks in parts. It's very cheap. Um, you should get pads. A lot of people say, oh, make pads out of tin foil and wire. Don't do that. Just go out and buy like tens unit pads and then cut the, buy the gel ones, the gel ones. Um, and then you cut right. them into the shape so you can put them on your mastoid behind your ear. All right. There goes my weekend. <laughs> Thanks. First of all, I'm very excited for the Rift. I can't wait until it comes out. And I don't want to be a downer about this, but when the 3DS came out, Nintendo recommended that children under six didn't use it because it could affect their eye development. Is there any sort of safety concerns that we should be aware of for this Oculus Rift? Yes, yeah, six-year-olds shouldn't use the Rift. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, the, 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 the more, no. there, there's actually a more complex answer. Right now, they definitely shouldn't. Um, one of the things about 3D content, a lot of people they say, oh, I get headaches on 3D content or it makes, gives me eye strain. One of the reasons for that is that typically 3D systems, be they movies or games or whatever, <coughs> they, have pre, they, they have settings that are locked. It was filmed with a certain camera separation and now they're playing it back on a screen at a certain stereo separation. And they have to make it so that it works well for everyone. Um, you know, from children to adults. They don't want to make content that only works for a certain set of people. And as a result, some people that are you know, on the far end or the low end of you know, IPD is your inner pupillary distance. People on, on either far end of the scale, they'll often have problems with stereo content because it's so out of whack with how they actually see the world. They'll see 3D, their brain will make it work. Our brains are incredible at fixing errors, but it's going to give them eye strain. Um, 
So let's say that we tried to put a six-year-old in the Rift right now. The current developer kit, it has a pretty wide, it's called an exit pupil, the area in which your eye can be and still see an image. And we can adjust the separation in software to work. But a six-year-old child isn't fully developed. Their eyes are pretty close together. They have a very narrow IPD. Putting them in a rift isn't a good idea because the lenses are so far off axis from where a six-year-old's eyes are going to be that software isn't going to be able to fully compensate. Um, and the 3DS, that's one of the same things. The 3DS isn't really that tunable. You, you're increasing the separation of the 3D effect, but what it's doing is it's taking the left image, the right image, and beaming them out at a certain angle. That angle isn't really being changed. Uh, someone with narrow eyes, it's not a good idea, especially because they're developing. You don't want to ruin the way that their stereo perception uh, you know, evolves. Now, in theory, going into the future, we want to have a far more adjustable IPD where you can actually adjust the optics to match a person and be able to report it in software. So that way, in the game, it can say, okay, this is where their eyes are, this is where the lenses are, and this is where the image in the game needs to be. And you can render those in-game cameras to perfectly match their eyes. In theory, that means at some point in the future, six-year-olds could use the Rift. <laughs> but to be safe, I would probably say don't because it's a lot better to just you know, say, sorry, man, you can't, you can't play until you're a little older than to have them potentially screw up their vision. Is that good? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Hi. Uh, when I had a chance to try the Rift last month, and it was really cool, by the way, but uh, when I had a chance to try it, I was uh, led to believe that there was sort of a, a learning curve for the brain in order to just be, not be totally bewildered by the effect. And I'm wondering, is that something for VR that's sort of a, just a permanent problem? Is that something that can be fixed? It's a combination of permanent problems and temporary problems. So temporary problems, there's so many things that we can do to increase the, the, to increase the, there's a lot we can do to fix these problems. Like one thing that we have right now, we have uh, rotational tracking. We can track where you're, you know, where you're looking perfectly. Um, and better than that, we can actually tell sort of where your head is because when you move your head and you tilt it, your head is moving through space. It's doing, this, it's not just spinning in space. And we, can, we have a neck model in our SDK that accounts for that. What it can't do is track me, you know, moving like this or, you know, leaning from side to side. And that's something that can make some people, if they're moving, especially if they move a lot, it can really disorient them because they're not used to moving like this and then their real world actually being kind of drug along with them. Um, but that's something that can, be, that can be fixed. You know, there's already fixes. It's just a matter of implementing them into, into the system. Um, Latency can be improved. Latency is, it, it's at the point where for a lot of people they say it's imper imperceptible. I'm pretty sensitive to latency because I know what I'm looking for and I think that people can learn what to look for. But latency can certainly get better and that will help people um, adjust to VR quicker because the closer VR is to the real world, uh, the, the easier it is, it, the easier it's going to be for them to adjust to it. Now the permanent problems, Assuming you could make perfect VR technology, let's pretend that we're, we've come up with GVS or an alternative or you know, brain plugs, whatever it is. We've made the perfect VR system, something that simulates reality flawlessly, right? The problem is that there are certain experiences that make people sick in real life. Um, like if, you know, going back to the scout I mentioned earlier, you're playing scout in Team Fortress 2. Most of the good players, a lot of their gameplay involves running around backwards, jumping through the air, and then firing backwards, you know, moving through the air at 40 miles an hour. That's something that's going to make people sick if it's perfectly simulated. There's, there's no real way around that yet, except for, I don't know, like Dramamine. Um, <laughs> so, so yes, right now people have to accommodate. There's a lot of room for improvement. Like I said, the technology we have today isn't the holy grail of gaming. The holy gra grail is quite a ways down the road when the technology matures. But you're always going to have to keep in mind that when you're simulating reality, there are certain things you can't do. Thank you. Hi. Uh, earlier you had mentioned that uh, current games kind of use an exaggerated animation style to uh, promote emotions and get uh, players to kind of understand meaning behind narrative or other character development. Um, do you think that with VR, these kind of uh, dramatic animation styles that are exaggerated are going to be ditched, or is there still going to be a place for that? I don't think that it's going to be ditched. I mean, the, it, it's about creative expression. I mean, um, the, there's, lots of, there's lots of performers that do actually way overact, even beyond what's required for performing. So people aren't going to say, hey, you know, now that VR is possible, we're never going to act, you know, overact again. We're never going to have uh, those crazy characters that act you know, in line with their perfect little cli uh, cliche where you know exactly who they are. Um, I think what VR does is it makes them, it makes it less necessary. It gives you a wider range of what you can do. It doesn't necessarily make anything impossible. Um, 
I imagine that probably fewer games would want to have overact. I mean, how many people have played the game where you've got like the old, you know, disgruntled military commander that hates your guts, but then eventually sacrifices himself for the greater good? I mean, it happens over and over again. It's like, I know it's going to happen, and he shouts, and he screams, and he's super, you know, Colonel Testosterone. But, uh, you know, maybe that won't be necessary with virtual reality for every game. Thank you. Hi there. I really enjoyed your talk. Thank uh, you. We are working in um, virtual reality based simulators for training in robotic surgery. So I have a lot so of. So you, you know what I'm talking about? Yes, exactly. And I mean, yeah, I mean, these are ideas all over in our own minds that, you know, we, we love like coming in action uh, in today. But, anyways, apart from that, this is the first time that I'm actually hearing about your product. Shame on me. But I'm going to go check it out. This is so cool. I was wondering if you looked into eye tracking at all in your head mounting display. So yes, I have thought about eye tracking. Lots of people thought about eye tracking because it, it, it's, it's something that could really improve the experience in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, what's the best way to run through this? It wasn't part of my presentation. It could have been, but I didn't want to talk about things that can't be done. Um, so eye tracking can be done. The tech exists and not even you know, in, in the high end. There's actually uh, people who have repurposed uh, <coughs> PlayStation eye cameras. To do, to do eye tracking, just mounted on simple rigs with infrared LEDs. It can be done pretty cheaply. Uh, the problem is what do you do with eye tracking that is really useful? There's always going to be applications like, oh, you, know, you can use it for UI, um, you can use it for controls, but those are things that really haven't been explored. It wasn't something that was a priority for the first version of our developer kit to say, hey, you know, we want you to learn how to use this new type of technology. Oh, and also eye tracking, which nobody has ever, ever really even thought about. Um, the other problem, <coughs> is that the things you really want to do with eye tracking are like one really cool thing would be to adjust you know, how much detail you're putting into the scene based on where you're looking in yeah. the scene so that you can uh, more efficiently use the power that you have. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is that doing that requires that you do really fast eye tracking. I, our eyes can move incredibly fast. They can, actually spin, they can actually spin at about 900 degrees per second, which is just, I mean, it's just incredibly, incredibly fast. And having software that's able to react fast enough and use it in a useful way, you know, where the eye, we don't look forward, we don't, we don't look like this. This isn't what our eyes are doing. They actually go like this as you're looking around, like all the time. Being able to track that fast enough and re-render a scene to match is, it, it's not really possible with today's technology. And then the other thing that'd be really cool would be depth of field. So where you could have the focus in game actually changing to match uh, what it would be in real life. So I pick up this water bottle again, great prop, and I'm looking at it. And the game tracks my eyes. They know I'm looking at it. And in theory, it would adjust elect electromechanically or something. Mm -hmm. It would adjust the lenses so that the focus that I was, the, the focal length that I was looking at would be the same as where this bottle was. And uh, at some point, we'll get lens technology that can do it, but it's not now. So eye tracking can be really cool. Eye tracking can be done at some point in the future. It's not even close to impossible. It's all a matter of, find, of, get, of, of getting good reasons to use it. Um, that can take advantage of what eye tracking is capable okay. of. So thank you all for coming. Thanks for listening to me talk. Very flattering. <laughs>